This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. January 27, 1973. The signing of the Paris Peace Accords marked the end of American involvement in Vietnam. Just one week later, an Air Force spy plane monitoring North Vietnamese tank movements encountered heavy ground fire and crashed in the jungle with all hands on board. Today, the families of two crewmen believe their sons did not die and that the end of the story has not yet been written. Paul Stamper was an energetic, successful young businessman. But when his wife walked out on him, Stamper targeted her in a vengeful campaign of abuse and violence. Meet Josephine White, a human chameleon, a charming con artist, a master of the pigeon drop. For years, she has preyed on elderly victims to the tune of more than one million dollars. We'll also bring you the touching update of a woman who spent more than 40 years searching for her long lost twin sister. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Families across the country were rejoicing as their husbands and sons began coming home from the distant jungles of Southeast Asia. On January 27, 1973, the Paris Peace Accords had been formally ratified. There would be no more American involvement in Vietnam. But for some families, the war would never end. While other soldiers still stationed overseas were writing joyful letters to their wives and girlfriends back home, Air Force Sergeant Peter Cressman was writing to his congressman. Dear sir, on January 27th, I read the headlines which hailed the Peace with Honor Agreement, only to wake the next morning to find my situation the same as the day before, as though nothing had changed in Southeast Asia. Feeling that I must have missed some of the small print of the agreement, I again read it and found that I had not overlooked anything that was on the printed page. It was then that I realized that I and others in my unit were in violation of an agreement which I considered to be an order from the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States. Sergeant Peter Cressman was the youngest of three brothers to serve during the Vietnam conflict. He was an electronics expert who flew top secret reconnaissance missions. Every day since the ceasefire, his squadron had continued to operate as if nothing had changed. Last night, an NKP mission picked up some short transmissions at 0130. I went to seek advice at the base legal office. There I was informed of the consequences for refusing to carry out the orders, which I consider to be illegal as well as immoral. These consequences instilled in me a fear which has caused me to abandon any thoughts of refusing to obey these illegal orders. Are there any questions? Okay, good luck. On February 4th, 1973, one week after the ceasefire, Peter Cressman and seven other men boarded an EC-47Q surveillance plane, codenamed Baron 52. The electronics experts, Cressman among them, were situated in the rear of the plane. 1490? 1490. Check. The flight plan called for Baron 52 to proceed from Ubon Air Force Base in Thailand into Laos, a neutral country which borders Vietnam and Cambodia. 
The assignment was to monitor a column of North Vietnamese tanks which were moving into Cambodia along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. At 11.05 p.m., Baron 52 departed. Two and a half hours later, reports came in that the plane was receiving heavy ground fire. Five minutes later, radio transmissions ceased. Two days later, the wreckage of Baron 52 was located in the jungle deep inside Laos. A rescue team recovered the remains of only the co-pilot. Declared missing in action were Peter Cressman and six other men. Three officers and three electronics experts, including 21-year-old Joseph Matijov. While Matijov's father died in 1984, his mother vividly remembers every detail. Two military men, an officer and a sergeant, came to the home to inform me that Joe was missing in action, that his plane had been shot down. But there was a possibility that some of the men may have bailed out of the plane. I felt a little feeling of relief because he was missing and not killed. I thought there was some chance that I might see him again. It was 18 days later that they returned and they informed us that none of the men had gotten out of the plane. There was no way they were not wearing parachutes. The plane went down into a spin, and none of the men could possibly get out. I'm Sergeant Burles. This is Colonel Halgren. So they declared them all killed in action. They said that they did see remains in the plane. A plane had been burned. So we believed them. Of course, I... Peter Cressman's mother had also received word that her son's status had been changed from missing in action to killed in action. If my government said that he had been killed, or they all had perished in the crash, then it had to be true because they wouldn't go around and tell a family that this had happened unless they had positive proof. Okay. Several weeks later, the Air Force forwarded Peter Cressman's personal belongings to his parents. They found the letter he had written, but never mailed to his congressman. Peter's father passed away in 1989, but he and his other sons had always questioned the status change from missing to killed. The letter only served to heighten their suspicions. They were declaring him dead, but there was no, no body. And we understand that, you know, bodies can burn up or disappear in combat, but in this case, uh, there was just nothing. And uh, because of the classification of the missions, they never had anything to back up their position. Now, according to this, the rescue team found one body, and there were no parachutes in the plane. For five frustrating years, the Cressmans wrote various Air Force officials seeking specific details about Peter's case. The Air Force response remained consistent. Based on the condition of the wreckage and the lack of a distress call, there was simply not enough time for the flight crew to bail out. The official report concluded that all members of the crew of Baron 52 were killed in the crash. Hello. Then in June of 1978, the Cressmans received a surprising phone call from an attorney with a national MIA organization. He said, I really don't know how to tell you people this. You're the first family I've contacted. But there's evidence that I've seen that indicates that at least four of the people on your brother's aircraft uh, not only survived the incident, but were captured by North Vietnamese forces. The attorney had learned of a report by investigative journalist Jack Anderson. Anderson claimed that U.S. military intelligence intercepted a North Vietnamese communique shortly after Baron 52 went down. In 1973, Terrell Menarson was an air defense analyst for the National Security Agency. His job was to decipher intercepted North Vietnamese messages. We saw a specific uh, North Vietnamese communique requesting transportation for the captured American bandit pilots. We felt at the time uh, that these messages were seen, that based on the logistics, based on uh, uh, the lack of American activity, 
due to the ceasefire, that the only personnel who could have been captured were the ones from Baron 52. There was a good probability some of the crew members had survived, parachutes were missing. So they probably parachuted out, and we knew that uh, they had been captured, that they were already in the hands of the Vietnamese and into the prison system. My husband, a military man, a career military man, we were certainly dedicated to serving our country. So it was hard for us to believe. I telephoned my husband at work, and I told him what I heard. And he immediately said that we would have to make arrangements to go to the Pentagon to pull Joe's file out and to study it ourselves to see just what had really happened. Mr. and Mrs. Manager, I yes. have these two files for you. Okay, thank you. I'll be back in a half hour to pick them up. Thank you very much. Thank you. When we went to the Pentagon, uh, they showed us Joe's file. They brought us into a little room where we could sit together and study it. And there in the file were copies of the radio intercepts. Much of them were blacked out. There was very little that we could read. But we saw enough evidence in his file to show that the government knew all along that these four men had been captured. My husband didn't want to be bitter, but it was beginning to hurt him more and more. And he, I would hear him at night when he thought I was asleep. And uh, I could hear him sometimes cry, and he would mutter, Joe, I'd, I'd hear him talking out loud when he thought I was asleep. No, it, it never got off of his mind. He was very much hurt by the whole issue. The Defense Intelligence Agency does not deny the existence of the North Vietnamese communique. However, the DIA claims the nationality of the captured pilots was never specified. Consequently, they determined that the prisoners were not the crew members of the Baron 52. Then in 1986, Jerry Mooney, a retired intelligence analyst, testified before Congress that Peter Cressman and Joseph Matajab were prisoners of war, but not in Southeast Asia. Incredibly, he claimed they had been transported to the Soviet Union. Uh, Terrell Menarsen agrees that the men could have been transported to the USSR. Special types of prisoners, in other words, prisoners with, with special knowledge, special um, experience, were being rounded up throughout the various prisoner war camps throughout North Vietnam and sent to Hanoi to be turned over to the Russians for exploitation. From that point, they were flown from Hanoi uh, across the northern route, which would be northern Laos, northern Burma, uh, down into India for refueling and then up to Moscow. I had information stating that they had been flown out to the Sokol area. There is no concrete evidence that POWs were transported to Russia during the Vietnam conflict. However, the Soviets have recently pledged to search through their penal system in the unlikely event that any Americans were ever brought into their country. One question continues to haunt the families. If the government had knowledge that their sons had been captured, why had their status been changed to killed in action? According to Mrs. Matijov, the answer could be found at the Paris peace talks. My husband made arrangements to meet with Dr. Roger Shields, the Assistant Secretary of Defense at the Paris peace talks. Dr. Shields told us that he was ordered to cross off the name of these four men from the EC-47Q from a list a government list of known live captured Americans and right over them killed in action. This plane was flying after the peace treaty was signed, therefore it was breaking the peace treaty. It was a covert operation. They were flying over Laos, and at that time, we said we were not at war with Laos, but we were having a secret war, and there was secret bombing going on. But we couldn't admit to that, so the only thing they could do was just wipe these men out as if they never existed, and that's what they did. So he was actually killed on paper at the Paris Peace Talks. Roger Shields declined to appear on camera. In a telephone conversation with Unsolved Mysteries, he stated that he was never ordered to cross off the names. In fact, he never had the authority to make a status change. However, he did acknowledge that Mrs. Matajov has every reason on earth to wonder if her son might still be alive.
A man puts on a uniform to serve his country should be brought back once he serves and brought back to his loved ones. So I like to speak out about that. Make sure, whatever you do, that you never let this happen again. God forbid there should be, ever be another war and other men forgotten. We didn't expect this kind of thing from, from the government, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it, and I had someone ask me once, well, do you consider yourself patriotic? As though the information that I was telling them about made me unpatriotic. Well, if something goes wrong in your family, you do what you can to straighten it out. You admit to what the problem is. And uh, obviously, I don't believe they've admitted to this day what the problem is. The Air Force and the Defense Intelligence Agency continue to maintain that there is absolutely no proof that any of the men aboard Baron 52 were captured. The official report reads, following the loss of Baron 52, none of its crew was ever seen alive, and there is no intelligence whatsoever which would indicate that any of the crew survived the incident of loss. For nearly 20 years, both the Air Force and the Defense Department have stood by the classification of Peter Cressman and Joseph Matajab as killed in action. However, there is one odd footnote to this story. At the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., seven of the eight crewmen who were lost on Baron 52, including Cressman and Matajab, are inexplicably listed as missing in action. In the summer of 1924, sharecropper Rufus Hinkle of Greenville, Tennessee, was forced to make an agonizing decision. Rufus's wife died after giving birth to twin girls, Mary and Martha. With little money and nine other mouths to feed, Rufus felt he had no choice but to put the twins up for adoption. Within a few months, Mary and Martha were adopted by separate families. Rufus never saw his daughters again. He passed away in 1950. Later on, I heard that they would not tell us where they were at until my father died. So shortly after he died, we started looking for the twins, and we found Mary. Why don't you come on over here and have a seat? Let me in September of 1955, Shorty and Mary were reunited at her home in Bluefield, West Virginia. That afternoon, Mary received a special surprise. Mary, I've got some news for you. You have a twin sister named Martha. Really? Really. I just don't kind of explain how I did feel, not, not knowing that I had a, a twin sister, a part of me. Unfortunately, little was known of Martha's whereabouts. Then in 1986, Martha's niece, Jackie Reynolds, learned that Martha had been taken in by the Meeks family of Johnson City, Tennessee. I've never found any trace of the Meeks whatsoever, so I really don't know what happened to them from there. I've often wondered if it's been good or if Martha's life has been bad. Uh, you wonder about them things. Shortly after our broadcast, one of our viewers, Sandy Detain of San Bernardino, California, contacted the Hinkle family with surprising news. During a search for her mother's biological family, Sandy accidentally discovered the location of Martha Hinkle's adoptive family. Martha lived with John and Lida Meeks for three years. When the couple divorced, Martha was taken in by the Dan Jackson family of Johnson County, Georgia. In 1940, she married James Thomas, and together they had four sons. Sadly, Martha passed away just weeks before the Hinkle family could contact her. I'm glad that, that I found her. We won't have to do no more searching. But it's so sad that I couldn't meet her, that, that I couldn't be with her just to talk to her just for just for an hour or two and tell her that I loved her. Although she never realized her dream of meeting her twin sister, Mary's 35-year search was not in vain. 
On July 27, 1991, Martha's four sons met Mary and a side of the family they had never known. That day, in a bittersweet reunion, two families came together as one. We were part of the family before we ever walked up and touched the one of them. It was written all over their faces. When we saw those smiles and tender hearts, all the little fears, big fears, the apprehensions just left. It was all over with. We glad to be home with our family. I'm proud that she left four sons, left part of her here for me to get together and know, know her through her sons. But part of them is gone that I, ne that I never found and I never will find, but she'll always be in my heart. Next, police are searching for a convicted felon who targeted his ex-wife for violence. November 23, 1985, Kingfisher, Oklahoma. 23-year-old Teresa Stamper left a small dinner party with her new boyfriend, Chris Butler. The quiet evening was a pleasant change for Teresa, who had just ended a marriage which was marked by violence and abuse. <laughs> Unbeknownst to Teresa, her estranged husband, Paul Stamper, was parked nearby, watching her every move through a high-powered telescope. That night would be the culmination of a reign of terror against his ex-wife. Paul Stamper never accepted his wife's decision to leave him. For six months, he stalked her, night and day, waiting for just the right moment to unleash his vengeance. Teresa was constantly looking over her shoulder, never knowing where or when her ex-husband would appear. Paul Stamper had changed. He was no longer the man Teresa fell in love with five years earlier. The booming oil business in the early 1980s had lured Paul Stamper to Kingfisher County, Oklahoma. Stamper set up a lucrative oil equipment operation and hired Teresa, then an impressionable 20-year-old, as his secretary. Paul was a real charmer, and you know, I, I worked for him, and he took me places, and we flew a lot of places, and you know, I was, you know, it was different for me, you know. Hey, Teresa, honey, you been outside yet this morning? Just, it was on my birthday. He called me oh, about 7 o'clock in the morning and said, second. have you been outside? And I said, no. So I looked outside, you know, and went out there, and there's this 82 red Corvette. <laughs> That's what he liked to do. He liked to spend money and buy nice things. So what do you think? What's this? Well, looks like a Corvette. This is for me? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but the best for my little girl. It's gorgeous. Come on, let's go for a ride. <laughs> you know, we had fun. He was really a lot of fun. He asked me to marry him, and I liked him. He was nice, and he was good to me, you know. And, and I liked living like that, you know. It was fun, and, and we got married. Teresa believed she was marrying a dynamic young businessman. In fact, Paul Stamper was a convicted felon with a record for theft, assault, and fraud stretching there, back to 1974. Stan, you have a little bit of a problem here. What you got? More recently, his business yeah, practices right. had yeah, come under investigation in Oklahoma. We had unconfirmed reports that he went out and destroyed some equipment on locations so that those same people would call him the very next day and have him come out and repair it. Within six months, the marriage became a living hell for Teresa. Do you mind telling me where the hell you've been? He's at the grocery store getting dinner. Been gone for two hours. Now, who are you with? He started watching me and having people follow me, and he wouldn't let me visit my friends. I want to know who you were with, and I want to know it now! 
And in one moment he would be nice, and the next moment he would hey, no, wait, no, hit me. And I just, I didn't know how to handle him. You get everything for you, don't get you a nice place to live and buy you nice things, and you, you just, oh, you, you're running this around. Is crazy. So, I don't you have... shut up! Ow! Ow! He was jealous. And you had better be here when I get back. I mean, I could be sitting at, we could be sitting at a red light, and I could just turn and look at someone and it could be a, a guy sitting in this car and he would just double his fist up and just hit me right in the mouth. I mean, it was just, it was unreal to the abuse that he did to me. Stamper was arrested and charged with assault and battery against his wife on no less than five occasions. Each time the charges against him were inexplicably dropped. Stamper bragged to Teresa that he was paying off the authorities. We had heard rumors that, uh, that there was payoff attempts. Uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Um, we, we looked into a couple of incidents. We could absolutely find no basis for it, uh, but there was a lot of talk about it. By the second year of the marriage, the violence reached a frightful climax. On the evening of January 5th, 1985, a man slipped into the Stamper's home. Teresa was out of town, and a friend was staying over. Thankfully, the friend survived the attack and called the police. The woman later identified her assailant as Gary Trout, a local mechanic who worked for Paul Stamper. Gary Trout informed me that Paul Stamper had contacted him and asked, and Paul asked of Gary to kill his wife and was willing to pay $5,000 up front and then $5,000 to finish it. Stamper was arrested and charged as an accessory to the attempted murder. But when Gary Trout's case went to court, he refused to finger his boss. Once again, all charges against Stamper were dropped. Meanwhile, Teresa moved in with her parents, yet she never felt completely safe. Stamper threatened her repeatedly, and on the night of September 13, 1984, he left a violent calling card. I had uh, went to the window and looked out the window, and there he was, just revving up the engine. And he just let me see him and let me know that he did it, and that he just drove off. Teresa reported the incident to the sheriff's department, but again, nothing was done. Teresa remained separated from her husband for more than a year. Despite continuing harassment from Stamper, she tried to put her life back together. Then came the night of November 23rd, 1985. That evening, Teresa and her new boyfriend, Chris Butler, had left the dinner party at approximately 11.30 p.m. We were just driving down the highway, and, you know, we weren't speeding or anything, and all of a sudden, these lights come on, and we thought it was a highway patrolman. So Chris pulls over. It's real, you know, late. No one was driving on the highway. Teresa, honey, you get out of the car. What hey, man, doing? she's not taking orders. Hey, you shut up. What are you doing with my wife anyway, huh? I don't think that's any of your business. Put down the gun. Get out of the car now. Come on. Hey. No. 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 Chris. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What are you doing? Open the door. I'll shoot you through the okay. window. Come on. Okay. Finally, you know, he. I was so scared that I just I unlocked the door. And he just grabbed me around my neck and just forced me out of the car. Chris had come to and he had yelled, don't leave me here, you know. Teresa, don't leave me here. And, you know, and there, was, there wasn't anything I could do. Sheriff's deputies and paramedics were summoned by a passing motorist. Chris Butler was in critical condition. The bullet had punctured his heart pancreas, spleen, and lung.
but miraculously he survived. Paul Stamper held a gun to his ex-wife and headed north. Two days later, they stopped at a restaurant just outside of Topeka, Kansas. Two coffees. Is that it? That's it. Look, I gotta go to the bathroom. I was walking toward the restrooms, and I kind of looked around my shoulder, you know, to see if he was following me, and he wasn't. He was just sitting there with his back toward me. And so I just took off running. Teresa ran to the manager's office and pleaded with him to call the police. Yeah, could you send an officer by here? I've got a crazy name. By the time the authorities arrived, Paul Stamper had vanished. Five hours later, police caught up with Paul Stamper as he boarded a bus in Salina, Kansas. He was returned to Kingfisher County and held in the county jail to await trial. Six months later, 3.30 a.m., a man who had been offered $10,000 by Stamper broke into the Kingfisher County Jail. Paul Stamper escaped and has not been seen since. I'd consider Paul Stamper extremely dangerous. Reason being, he's desperate, doesn't want to be caught, knows he's looking at life in prison once caught, and, uh, and a desperate person do desperate things. He's out there somewhere, you know, watching me. He knows what I do, what I do and I don't think he knows where I live now, but, um, you know, I just don't think it's right that he should be out there maybe doing it to somebody else, you know? Update. Just minutes after this story aired, the FBI received information from several of our viewers that Paul Stamper was living in Commerce City, a suburb of Denver, Colorado. One phone call was very specific. It had uh, his alias, it had his location, his address, his employment, that he was driving a semi-truck overland, and that brought an immediate response from the Denver FBI so that we moved out within the hour. Just three hours after our broadcast, Paul Stamper was arrested as he left his home. The fugitive had been living in the Denver area under the assumed name Gary Wickle for approximately four years. This is one of the more efficient, uh, cost-effective, speedy apprehensions that we've ever made. For us to uh, not have any idea early evening that this individual is in the Denver area, and by 11.30, he is captured, he's off the streets, and he's on his way to Denver City Jail. That, uh, I think, may be close to a record for us. Paul Stamper was returned to Oklahoma and is currently being held in the Kingfisher County Jail while awaiting trial on charges of kidnapping and attempted murder. If convicted, Stamper could receive life in prison. When we return, the saga of Josephine White, a con woman with a thousand faces. April 26, 1989, Norwood, Massachusetts. An elderly woman is approached by a stranger who seems nervous and agitated. The elderly woman is a Lithuanian immigrant whom we'll call Barbara. This seemingly chance encounter would change her life. Here, right by that newspaper, I found this bag. But let me show you what I found. I found this. I think there's about $70,000 in there. What, what do you think we should do? I says, you better go to police to find out 
Oh, she says, no, I don't go to police. Maybe they take money and uh, I don't want that. Well, let me show you this. I also found, inside, I found this note. And look, look, this is all it says. It says, dear brother, we've done it again. This time at the racetrack, I've enclosed the money and sent it this way to avoid paying income tax. And then it signed Jose. Excuse me, ladies, but is, is that something wrong? May I be of any help to you? Well, um... What is it? What's okay, wrong? Uh, Barbara's a volunteer hospital yeah. worker, retired and living on a small pension. She is about to fall victim to one of the oldest tricks in the book, the pigeon drop. The wad of money she has been shown is worthless. The woman is a con artist, the man her accomplice. You know, my, my boss is like, he's like a tax specialist. I mean, he's a wizard with finances. Barbara, an immigrant with a limited command of English, confronted with an amount of money she has never seen before, is a perfect target for an acknowledged master of the pigeon drop, Josephine White. Since 1963, White has allegedly scammed more than 100 elderly women and men, all of them living on small fixed incomes. Once I pinned down that the person I was looking for was Josephine White, I was surprised to see how many different appearances that she had. She changes like a chameleon. She puts on weight, she loses weight. She was described in a number of different fashions. And in addition to her own appearance changing, she'll use wigs, sunglasses, um, quite a bit of jewelry. And very often, this will grab a woman's attention away from their actual physical appearance. Why don't we just go talk to him? I mean, you'll know what to do. It is a good idea. Come on, it's a great idea. So Josephine else? White and her accomplice are about to move into phase two of the pigeon drop. They persuade Barbara to go with them to get advice from Josephine's boss. Godsend. You know, I don't know how I would have gotten into college if I hadn't met you people. And, and, and I mean, and then my wife, oh, God, What's God wrong bless with her. So, well, well, she's got a cancer in the stomach or something. And, and when to lure Barbara further into their trap, the accomplice spins out a poignant hard luck story, emphasizing how desperately he needs the money. And God, this is the luckiest day of my life. No, this is the luckiest day of all our lives. This is great. Oh. Yes, it's so nice to meet such wonderful people. Oh, you good yeah. man, honey. You yeah. good lady, too. Yes, yeah, so are you. They arrive at an office building where Josephine claims her boss works. Don't worry. I don't know. Uh, maybe we should tell police. Ma'am, don't worry about it, please. We can't take it to the police because we'll never get the money back. You know, and I need the money. My wife is dying of cancer. The police find Jose. The older woman actually wants to do the right thing. Now, again, the third party is only reinforcing the idea that this is the best thing to do. And even though the victim may make mention of backing out of the situation, the third party puts the pressure on them. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. So she has emotion playing on one side and pressure of the money being given to her on the other side. She's really caught in a vice. I told you everything was going to be OK. This is what he said. We can keep the money. Josephine White tells him that her boss says they can legally keep the money, $22,000 a piece. But she claims that a $5,000 good faith deposit for income tax purposes is required. Do you have a credit card on you? Oh, no, I don't use... Phase three of the scam now begins. Convince Barbara to put up the $5,000. Did you have your bank book on you? Oh, no, my bank book. Oh. Well, we'll stop off at your house and get it, okay? Okay, let's get going. Let's go. These people come along and they talk so quickly and they offer you all kinds of grand schemes. And the second person is jumping in as soon as the first person stops. So pretty soon the victim's head is spinning. You know, the idea of money, the idea of what should we do with the money, and pretty soon she's being directed. She's having all her thoughts channeled by these two people who are actually manipulating her and manipulating her thoughts. Remember, by the end of the day, you'll have the $5,000 back in the bank plus $22,000 more. And you're sure you want to take it all? Oh, I sure. I sure. All right. What size bills do you want that in? One hundreds, please. One hundreds. One, two. The five thousand dollars represents five, nearly five, all of Barbara's six, savings. Seven, eight, nine, ten, one thousand. One, 
Josephine White returns to the same office building. I will give she tells Barbara she will show the $5,000 to her boss. A few minutes later, White returns and triggers a final phase of the pigeon drop. You can go in and get your money now, room 204. Barbara is instructed to meet with the boss herself. We'll be right here waiting for you. There was nobody there. I just look around and then I come back again to the place where they was parked. Barbara finds the parking lot empty. Josephine White, the car, the man, and Barbara's $5,000 have vanished. The scam has taken less than two hours. At this point, the victim is devastated. The victim doesn't know what to do. They didn't know whether to cry, to collapse, to walk away. They just, you know, they're just lost. Their trust has been betrayed. So what ends up happening is they eventually walk around and they go over it. They mull it over in their mind. Geez, if I tell my family, they're going to think I'm a stupid old woman. If I tell my son, he may put me in a nursing home. And all these terrible thoughts go through their mind in conjunction with the embarrassment and the problems of losing large sums of money. So I don't understand myself how I did that. But I trust her. She says, you get this 5,000 back, and you get one two more. I trust. That's why I did. Josephine White has built her victims out of nearly a million dollars. Just two weeks ago, she struck again in two different Boston suburbs. White sometimes uses the names Judith Hunt or Judith Campbell and operates primarily along the East Coast and in California. Next, Unsolved Mysteries. In Florida, a bright, energetic young mother suffered years of abuse at the hands of her brutish husband. When she finally walked out, he decided to take revenge. In 1969, a lonely young boy found friendship and understanding with the help of Big Brothers of America. Now he wants to find the man who turned his life around. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Thank you.